today's guest on take two is Vernon Forster, who I have known for oh almost 40 years, I'm going to say. Uh, Vernon has been a really interesting business person, a business leader, lots of acclaim. And uh, the, his most recent project is he wrote this book called Keep Your Balls Inflated. Um, maybe we'll tell you the story or maybe you have to get the book to understand what that story actually means. Vernon, uh, it is so lovely to see you and to talk about this book. So first question I want to ask you is, if you could summarize your entire working career in two or three words, what would they be? Uh, fun working with people. Fun working with people. Okay, I'll give you the. I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, why did you write this book? Well, I'm a storyteller, and I have lots of stories. And I'm now ninety, and when I was eighty-seven, I said maybe a lot of people said maybe you should put this on paper. So that it'll be preserved for antiquity or whatever. And I said, well, I don't know whether antiquity would be that interested in it, but I started to try. And then I met Morris Bridge, who you know. Yes. I know. He's a former newspaper man, amongst other things. And we chatted and chatted back and forth. And we said, well, why don't we go ahead? And we had lots of fun doing it. So what are you hoping people take away from this book? I mean, it is basically a lot of your stories and it sounds just like me sitting around. If I close my eyes, it sounds just like me sitting around and listening to you tell those stories. What are you hoping that people that don't know you will take away from it? Well, I think I'll take away a couple of things, hopefully. And that is the, the idea of having a business and making lots of money and piling it up and buying, you know, $200,000 cars and $8 million houses and heaven knows what else, uh, that, that has to stop. That really has to stop. We have to, I mean, it's great to be successful. I, I think I'm successful and have maybe some minor pleasures in life, but I don't think it's appropriate in this day, in fact, any day, to keep piling up money and looking at people who are not so well off, who are probably equally competent, uh, struggling. And uh, my motto in life is to, we work hard, I work hard to boost people up and out to achieve their potential. That's my objective in life. And I hope people might take notice of that and maybe to some degree put that in their hip pocket anyway and copy it when appropriate. So one of the initiatives that you brought in was this whole notion that you didn't want to see people stay as cashiers at Canadian Tire for their entire lives. You wanted them to go through and, and you started a program that was pretty innovative. I think even the New York Times profiled you uh, to say, wow, look at this innovative program where this guy wants to get rid of his employees. Well, yeah, what happened was I have three daughters, all favorites, and my <laughs> business partner, Don Graham, had uh, three sons and a daughter. And they're all around the same age. We're sitting around chatting all the time. Do we want our children to be cashiers at age 45 or 35? And the answer is no. So how do we go about that? Well, we can force our kids out to get, you know, go to BCIT or UBC and acquire some educational qualifications that would move them forward. But maybe it's more basic than that. So what we did, we started a program called the Ignition Program. Ignition, getting people started. So we'd hire them out of high school and we'd get them to sign their letter of resignation. So they had to leave us after 6,240 hours, which is three years at 52 weeks times 40 hours a week. You're probably not a mathematician, but take my word for it. <laughs> I'll take a word for it. You're the accountant, not me, man. 6,240 hours, that's it. And at that point, um, they would leave us and we would pay the first two years of university or trade school, BCIT, UBC, anything they wanted, as long as it was in British Columbia. And um, that way they'd be, get a kickstart. And while they were going to school, we would give them a, a part-time job at the high rate of pay which they left us at. So there'd be really no excuses for them not to go ahead. And even after the two years, they could still keep their part-time job as long as they're going to university. So we put, I don't know, through a uh, thousand people, maybe like that. Now, in the process of going through three years, 6,240 hours, <laughs> they may leave and go on in life. And that's fine, too. But we didn't want them to hang around us at uh, age 25 being a cashier or a stock boy or whatever. 
We put through with a hundred, you know, hundred people. In fact, it was so impressive. The New York Times came out and interviewed me. I got my picture of the New York Times. That's pretty I think cool. That's that's in, I think that's in the book. Yeah, it's in There's the book. A picture of that in, in the, the book. book. So people have to look at it. Um, so now, my even though you joined when you and Don Graham bought these, you know, opened these 21 Canadian tire stores in BC and opened up British Columbia to the company that hadn't been opened. Even though you were joining a, an established large organization, my sense is, as I read these stories and as I have heard you tell stories, you actually approached it as if you were an entrepreneur. Well, absolutely. Actually, all Canadian tire dealers were called, were called dealers, associate dealers, albeit. And uh, we're, we're all, most Canadian tire dealers are entrepreneurs to some degree. They Canadian Tire provide the building on which we pay rent. And then we provide all the fixtures and the staff and merchandise, and we operate it as a separate business. In fact, the difference in various, you go around to various Canadian Tire dealers, uh, they're all different to varying degrees, but we're not different, we're odd. <laughs> <laughs> which brings me to another question. And you and I have talked about this. Some of the stories in the book and some of the stories, again, that I've heard you tell um, that were, clever, brash, bold, those sorts of things. Today, my sense is that today, if you tried to pull some of those things off, they'd be running down the hall screaming to HR that you were bullying them. We never bullied anybody. You talk, you, we have, let me see, we were in business for 21 years, a thousand employees, changeover. We probably saw 100,000 young people come through our system. None of them felt bullied. They felt privileged. Now we kidded around a lot. We had a lot of fun. And by the way, I was the I was the butt of, of three quarters of the jokes. So if anybody should go out screaming down the hall, it'd probably be me. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have we we and anybody I kidded maybe unmercifully, they were people at the top. People right. at the top top don't go screaming down the hall, say they're a bully. All they do is look stupid doing that. <laughs> people don't normally like to do that so there's no I, we didn't bully anybody anybody in a position uh i shouldn't say below that's demeaning but in, under you know underneath the employees i don't bully them at all they bullied me <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that's true you you have said that there's nothing wrong with having favorites absolutely nothing as a matter of fact if you haven't got favorites you're not alive how can you not have favorites? Now, you have to be careful. I got three daughters, and they're all called favorite daughters. Of course. You, you, you don't. You, you, I had favorites, and they were fantastic favorites. And I mentioned them in the book. I have, and by the way, if you, you run a company and you pretend you don't have favorites, they'll catch on. People, the rest of the people know damn well who the favorites are. Yeah. So you might as well have fun with them and enjoy them. And, you know, I've had a few problems with favorites. as it is in the book, too. We, uh, we, um, one of my favorites didn't turn out too well. But <laughs> enjoy. In, the whole secret is you have to enjoy the people you work with. Have fun with them. And, of course, in that process, you're going to have favorites. You know, I, I don't think I treated my favorites uh, better than people, the rest of the people. But I, I really love my favorites. I, I, I love my employees. Not all of them, but most of them. So listen, um, we the title of the book is Keep Your Balls Inflated. Can you tell me the story behind that title? Absolutely. It's very catchy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People might misconstrue it. But anyway, what happens was we had a store in Abbotsford, I think it was, and the manager there this man called Doug McMillan. And he was a very fastidious guy. And uh, we used to have these contests every year. My partner and I, twice a year, my partner and I go around all the stores and we inspect them to see which one was the better equipped for the, let's say, the Christmas season or whatever. And we come to Doug's store and it was beautiful. The whole store was absolutely magnificent. We walk in and we get to the back of the store where the basketballs and soccer balls and those are displayed. And lo and behold, they were un infl under inflated. <gasps> horror. Uh, absolute screeching horrors. Yeah. And Doug asked, Doug, this is the most important thing in the store, which of course it wasn't, but anyway, the most important thing in the store. 
and your balls are underinflated and they're sagging and you have sagging balls here and we can't put up with that. <laughs> he was all gas out of this. Anyway, we all left. And then in the spring, we went around for the further inspection for the spring and the summer setup. We phoned the assistant manager of the store and said, hey, Charlie, you know, we're going to come and visit your store at 10 o'clock tomorrow. And we'll keep Doug busy at the front of the store. I want you to go in the back and let the air out of the balls. So, so there'd be sagging balls, just like they were before. He says, gotcha. The guy was practically, well, boy, practically, yeah, he was on to that, let me tell you. So we get to the store, we keep uh, Doug busy. And all of a sudden we finished with Doug and we, he signals us from the back saying, well, Doug, let's go around and see the store. And we come to the back of the, and the balls were under inflated. Well, I thought poor Doug was going to have hysterics. <laughs> anyway, we all laughed about that. But the message here is sort of like, find out what's important to the boss or to the public or, you know, or to you, for example. Find out what's important to them and make sure you make that at least a priority and make it look good. So the message here is really do what the boss inspects not what he expects. <laughs> Keep your balls inflated. <laughs> Keep your balls inflated. I, I do like that title. So yeah. Vernon, um, last question for you. What is next in the career of Vernon Forrester? Well, years like old? I'm 90, you know, and I only probably have another 20 or 30 years. So um, <laughs> it'll be uh, all objectives are rather short term. And uh, uh, keep, keep joking, keep laughing, keep enjoying the people. Enjoy what you're doing. You know, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, get something else to do. Yeah. You enjoy what you do. I know that. I do. And I enjoy speaking to you. Thank you so much for doing this, Vernon. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again. You Bye. too.